It's time to talk sports. It's Hacksaw's Headlines. A panorama of the world of sports. Stories, comments, and opinions. Touchdown, San Diego! Now, here's iconic sports talk show host Lee Hacksaw Hamilton and co-host John Riley. It's a Thursday in Southern California. Who wants to talk sports? Who wants to talk NFL draft? We do. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Lee Hacksaw Hamilton, along with my co-host, John Riley, from our studios in San Diego as we help kick off a great sports weekend. It's Thursday, NFL draft day. And, John, we have a ton of different topics on the table because we're going to jump from here, there, and everywhere Football, baseball, basketball, <laughs> hockey, you name it, we have opinions about it. Boy, what a day we got ahead of us. I mean, I could see right there on your clipboard. You've got the NFL draft guide right there. You've been going through all the data. You've been crunching the numbers. So I'm looking forward to this analysis. All right, let's start. National Football League draft. It's a couple of hours from now since we've launched here on a Thursday in our studios in San Diego. Let's talk about the top of the draft board. But before we do that... <laughs> the Baltimore Ravens stole the headlines within the last hour. Oh. They signed quarterback Lamar Jackson to a record high contract, five years, 260, 179 million guaranteed, full no trade clause. So they finally came to a solution. Lamar Jackson came to the realization he was not going to get a max guaranteed contract. But what he got was two hundred sixty million, one seventy nine of it guaranteed against injury, which means he's got in essence he's gotten four years guaranteed. Oh and wow! A no trade clause. It makes him the highest paid quarterback in the NFL. So he now vaults by Jalen Hurts, who signed a two fifty contract last week. Those two guys have jumped beyond Deshaun Watson, who got two thirty from Cleveland a year ago. And still out there, we have to see what happens with Joe Burrow, Cincinnati, Justin Herbert, Chargers. So the price tag on quarterbacks continues to go up and up and up. So yeah. how did the Baltimore Ravens sweeping by the headlines of the NFL draft to do this on the day of the draft? Well, they probably just want to lock them in, you know, so they got their quarterbacks settled and then they can focus in other areas on the draft. But Jalen Hurts was, what, $51 million per year? So, um, you know, Lamar Jackson's, what, 50 what? Probably 52-ish. 52-ish. So, yeah, you know, good for those guys, man. They're earning their money. Okay, let's talk about the NFL draft board, and we're going to do it a little bit differently here. Not necessarily predicting the first round, but I'll tell you what I've gathered information-wise from the network of people that I spend my life on email with <laughs> as, as to how this whole thing will, will fall. Carolina chooses number one. This has been a great debate in uh, uh, Winston-Salem, uh, Raleigh-Durham, uh, and Charlotte. What should they do? Uh, obvious, the owner has really carried the day. David Tepper had indicated to Frank Reich, I want you to take Bryce Young, Alabama. The owner injected himself into the meetings, not just watching him at his pro day at Ohio State, not just at the NFL Combine in Indy. He went to Tuscaloosa, met with Nitz Saban. He met with his parents, Bryce Young's parents in Alabama. So it looks as if this is a lock Bryce Young, despite the fact he's 5'10", 190, is going to be the starting quarterback for the Carolina Panthers. Good for them. This whole draft is going to spin based on what happens at number two. Left hand tells me Houston is still shopping that pick hard. Who would like to trade for the other quarterback, C.J. Stroud? The right hand tells me D'Amico Ryans is calling the shots. The new head coach, former defensive coordinator, San Francisco. I think they're going to draft defense rather than trade out of the slot. Now, the question is, who do they take? Certain segment of the Houston hierarchy wants Will Anderson at 17 and a half quarterback sacks at Alabama. Big, strong pass rusher can be a stand up linebacker, can be a three point down defensive end. Other group says there's a certain segment there that wants Tyree Wilson, very good pass rusher, monster season at Texas Tech, who's probably got bigger growth upside, but he is a down guy every down. If you're asking me, I think Houston takes Will Anderson out of, out of Alabama, uh, but it wouldn't shock me if they took the other guy. Uh, let's go to number three. Let's go to Arizona. And this is where it gets sticky. Arizona's talked to six to seven different teams that want to jump into the third slot and take C.J. Stroud, the Ohio State quarterback. And the latest, and to me this is a big drop, is Tennessee at 11. Tennessee at 11 
would have to really pay a steep price. And philosophically, does Arizona want to drop from three all the way back to 11? Now, granted, it's a good first round, but that's a heck of a drop. But maybe it's offset if you get a bunch of different assets like, John, give me your one. John, (laughs) give me your two. John, give me your four. If you want me to go from three down to 11, John, you're going to have to overpay. So that's where we are with with, uh, the Arizona situation. If they stay where they are at three, I think they're going to take Tyree Wilson, uh, the defensive end from Texas Tech, because Will Anderson had gone to uh, Houston. At number four, can you imagine the Colts sitting there and waiting to see if the world's going to jump in front of them? If this thing goes the way I'm projecting, C.J. Stroud, Indianapolis Colts, Mm -hmm. have not had a quarterback to build on in the last five years. Ever since Andrew Luck retired... They went through Jacoby Brissett, Philip Rivers' one-year rental. Obviously, they they tried really hard uh, with C.J. Wentz. That didn't work. Then they rented Matt Ryan. That was even worse because <laughs> the team fell apart around the quarterback. Yeah. Can you imagine if Ursay winds up with C.J. Stroud without having to overpay or move out of the fourth slot to jump ahead? Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. That That could happen in Indianapolis. That's the feeling. That's the way that... That's going to fall. Number five is Seattle. They've looked at a lot of different ideas. Uh, they've tried to rebuild this team. It didn't work initially. Then they traded Russell Wilson, got a ton of assets to make that deal happen. I think they're going to take the Georgia defensive tackle, Jalen Carter. Now, there's some issues about character here, but he's a stud. He's as big as a cement block, and he's active <laughs> at defensive tackle. Mm-hmm. And knowing Pete Carroll's history of dealing with problem players— I think they solved this Jalen Carter situation despite the things that he got involved with at the end of the season, the fatal auto accident with a teammate while they were drag racing and all that. I think Seattle takes Jalen Carter and he becomes the anchor uh, in their defensive front. Number six is Detroit. All kinds of rumors. Is Detroit going to trade back? Get more picks? Is Detroit going to make a move maybe to get the quarterback of the future to replace Jared Goff? I don't think so. This is such a really good defensive draft. And the Lions have had a lot of problems with guys in the secondary. They've drafted high players, and they can't keep them healthy. Uh, and they've had to move some of the guys because of cap issues. I think Detroit stays where they are at six, and I think they take Devin Witherspoon. Very good cover corner from the University of Illinois. That brings us to the Raiders. The silver and bleak. (laughs) I mean, silver and black. (laughs) Stop laughing. It's true. Uh, You know, what I do not understand is the Raiders spending all this time evaluating all these quarterbacks. When you gave Jimmy Garoppolo $67 million to come be your guy, to replace the guy you didn't want, Derek Carr, and you wound up trading him to New Orleans. Uh, Raiders definitely need defense, defense, and then a little bit more defense. Um, if I'm the Raiders, I take the best cornerback that's on the board. I think they would have loved to have had a shot at Jalen Carter, but Seattle was going to take him. So the Raiders at seven, I'm going to project Christian Gonzalez, really good athlete, University of Oregon, maybe the best cover corner a uh, very good Oregon, Oregon Ducks program has had in a long period of time. Atlanta's at eight. They can go in a lot of different directions. Uh, the fact that the quarterbacks, the top two guys are off the board, and I never thought there was any validity to the rumors Atlanta would trade from eight up to get to the second or third pick so they could take C.J. Stroud. Price would have been too steep. Uh, I think Atlanta does one of two things. Uh, they have a desperate need for a pass rusher, desperate need for offensive tackle. And then the weird part is the conversation. Maybe they take the heavy-duty running back out of Texas, Bijan Robinson, instead. Mm. So there could be something screwy going on in Atlanta, sitting there at 8. I'm, I'm going to have Atlanta take Paris Johnson, the massive tackle from Ohio State, because they really need to fix their offensive line. That brings us to 9, Chicago. Chicago had traded out of number 1, stockpile picks. I think Chicago is going to take the next best offensive tackle, who's really good, Peter Skaronsky from Northwestern University. 
And then at 10, we got Philadelphia. And there's a rumbling out there that Philadelphia is going to take the Texas running back, B. John Robinson. But there is another reality. They need to continue to build and get younger in the defensive front. And the next really good defensive lineman there is Nolan Smith, the defensive end from the University of Georgia. So that's the projection I have right now of of the top 10 picks. But everything swings on what they do in Houston at two or what they do in the midst of all this chaos in Phoenix with the Arizona Cardinals at three. Because if somebody trades back, that's going to mean the dominoes might start to fall a different way. So that's that's just a quick look at the top of the draft board. John, I threw a volume of information <laughs> at you. You're out there in left field. Move some of it around. Stand up and tell me what you think. Well, I mean, it's incredible how many great players there are in this draft. But we spent so much time talking about the quarterbacks. And there were five or six of them that we thought could be, you know, first round, second round picks. But there's only two in the top ten on your list. So I'm wondering if there's going to be more trades, if, if other teams are going to try to move up and secure some of those quarterbacks. I, I don't think so, John, because it's such a deep draft defensively. The third quarterback on the board is is Will Levis from Kentucky. Now, he could jump into the top 10. At one point, people thought maybe top five. That's the, Because there's so many great defensive players who come in and play immediately versus the quarterback you got to develop. That's why I don't think he's a top five quarterback. But Will Levis is there. And then Anthony Richardson from Florida, who's a freak athlete, but is really an uncut gem. That's that's a developmental project. I think there will be four, <coughs> excuse me, maybe the fifth quarterback of Herndon Hooker from Tennessee mm-hmm. gets drafted. I There could be five QBs, but this is such a deep draft defensively. And then you add on the massive quality offensive linemen. And then at the back end of the draft, they'll start to be a run on the wide receivers. That's why I don't think you see a huge push. that We've got to take five quarterbacks in the first 10 picks because I don't think there's five quarterbacks in the first 10 picks that weren't being chosen that high, being paid that amount of money. Because if you're drafting them, you're going to have to play them. And some of these guys are nowhere near ready. So I, I think there'll be a couple quarterbacks mid-round and then at the back of the round. But there's so many really good defensive players, offensive linemen, and then the, the, the package, select group of wide receivers. That's why there haven't been quarterbacks taken. Okay, let's move on. Okay. Next question here as we talk about the NFL draft a couple of hours away. Yeah, so, I mean, we got to talk here a little bit about, you know, the Chargers because they've got a lot of needs to fill. I mean, where do you think they're going to be uh, drafting? They're drafting 21st, and I think they're going to stay there because historically Tom Telesco, he's never traded up. And seldom do you trade back that far back. Uh, my gut feel is, and they're going to get a really good player at twenty-one. I get that now; they'll get their choice. They they could give the new offensive coordinator Kellen Moore an early Christmas gift, give him a pass catching tight end, and to me that's Dalton Kincaid or Mike Mayers. Kincaid, Utah, caught seventy. Mayers at Notre Dame, uh, caught in the fifties, but he's a much better blocker. They could go tight end there. It's weird with Austin Eckler and all that productivity that they might consider doing something with Bijan Robinson of Texas. But Robinson had an 1,800-yard rushing season for the Longhorns, and this is a stud. Now, they may bail out there because the rumblings are somebody's going to take Robinson maybe in the top 15. They do need defensive tackle help. It might be a reach at 21, but... Uh, There's a really good defensive tackle from the University of Pittsburgh that I I think they're going to pay attention to. His name is Kalaja Kansi. A lot of people have compared him favorably to Aaron Donald, former Pitt Panther Mm -hmm. star. Uh, Taking him at 21 might be a little early. He's not going to be there in the second round, I'll guarantee you that. Uh, And, you know, then then there's a group of wide receivers because they're going to need a replacement a year from now for one of the veterans who's going to get cut. Either Keenan Allen's going away or Mike Williams is going away because they can't afford to have two receivers with cap figures of $30 million. So the wide receivers that they might look at, uh, I mean, it's it's worth considering Jordan Addison from Southern Cal, more of a route runner than a real burner. 
Uh, and a kid who's really risen through his private meetings is Zay Flowers from Boston College, speed guy. And is also a really good wide receiver from Tennessee, though to take him at 21 is a little bit early. So I, I think that's what the Chargers are going to do. I think pass catching tight end uh, is probably the way to go. Now, something weird could happen in front of them where both Kincaid and Mayers could get selected. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody could go 15, somebody could go 19. Chargers wouldn't get him at 21. But if that happens, that means somebody else is coming down the board. And it might be the running back. It might be the defensive tackle. Uh you're a Charger fan, aside from hating the owner. <laughs> uh, you do like the offense. You love yeah. the quarterback. I yeah, know that. Sure. So tell me, who would you take? Well, I mean, I'm going back to that game where they collapsed against the Jaguars in, in the playoffs. I mean, what what was what went wrong that day, and what can they who can they draft to maybe solve that problem? Well, they've had historical problems stopping the run, which means stud, cement block, defensive tackle. Mm-hmm. That's the kid out of pit, uh, but. Is that a reach? He's projected at the back end of the first round, maybe. Hmm. Is it a reach to grab him at 21? Uh, they don't historically trade back, so you couldn't say, well, Tom Telesco, general manager, trade from 21 back to 25, get some additional picks. Well, because you don't know if somebody else will jump in there and take the kid from Pitt. And they've never, ever really done that. They've never been aggressive. Uh, on draft day. But you're correct. I mean, they haven't stopped the run in three years. Mm. And the debacle against Jacksonville, how's that taste in your mouth? Here we are in (laughs) April, and you're talking about bad taste in your mouth dating back to January. So Mm. that that really bears consideration going forward. And you got got the wide receiver thing you're going to have to deal with at some time, some place, because once you get beyond the top two stars and then the third wide receiver, Joshua Palmer, who I think we all like, they don't have a burner. They really need deep down the field speed. Uh, just look across the border, Kansas City. Hmm. God, they got burners everywhere. That's <laughs> what the Chargers have to consider there. Okay, on we go from there. Uh, let's move on in a second. But first, <laughs> as we're talking about the NFL draft, John, I want you to explain to everybody about what we're going to do at the end of the show on Draft Day Fans Forum and tell people about the new idea we have about rating us and reviewing us. Okay, sure. You can get involved in the Fans Forum. You got a question about the draft for Hacksaw, just drop it in the live chat on Facebook or YouTube. We'll see you here on our screen. We'll get you involved in the Fans Forum at the conclusion of Hacksaw's headlines. We already got a couple of questions rolling in already. So get in line, get involved. And yeah, if you'd like to leave us a rating and review, boy, that would be really appreciated. You know, on Apple Podcasts, it's common for a lot of podcast listeners to leave a review. Five stars if you think we deserve it. So, you know, check that out. And give us a thumbs up. And hey. I have no pride. I'll take a five-star rating. No problem (laughs) at all. By the way, go to my website, leehacksawhamilton.com. If you've never read it, it's all written. You will really like it. A ton of data today about the National Football League draft, and I write on it every day, so it's there first thing every morning. And by the way, I want you to make sure you tell all your friends. Tweet, text, Email them. Share what we do. Make it available. On we go. Let's talk baseball as our podcast continues. Oh, I, mean, I saw the Padre game this afternoon, and once again, they they just seem to be sputtering. So we got to get these guys in, in gear. Well, the Padres have an off day on Friday. They really need an off day. What they really need is starting to hit. Uh, the Padres are struggling or the Padres underachieving. I think it's the latter rather than the former. Uh, all kinds of statistics I could throw at you. Some explanations, some of them might be excuses. Fernando Tatis is stinging the ball. It hasn't started to drop in consistently, but he's had a bunch of hits recently. But going into the today's loss against the Chicago Cubs, El Nino was hitting just 222. Mm-hmm. But you get the sense that he's starting to find his rhythm. I don't know what to tell you about Soto. His batting <laughs> average is now a buck seventy-eight. Juan Soto, get this. Since early April, is hitting 150. Wow. You know, and I, we've talked about his mechanics at home plate, his movement, the fact that I don't think because he's shifting back and forth, he's getting a good view to read the pitch out of the pitcher's hands. And if you look closely, John, at him and his swings, I think his mechanics are so flawed, he's tomahawking the ball. He's not getting clean, good swings. Mm -hmm. Does he hit a home run? Yeah, occasionally. He's got four of them. Does he get a bunch of walks? Yeah, but leadoff guys can get walks, and the guys ninth in the batting order can get walks. 
He's a big money guy. He's got a hit. That's hit right. For average, and he's got a hit for power. He's not. Uh, I think Manny Machado is hurt. I think there's something going on, and maybe it's got to do with his back issue. He's not swinging the ball well. Now, he's making phenomenal defensive plays at third base. Padres have one of the best defenses in the league, fewest errors in the league, turn a ton of double plays, and he's kind of the focal point of everything that's going. But Manny did have a couple of hits here, but that's only one game, so I'm not ordering World Series tickets yet. You know, going into this Cubs game, he was hitting 212. It is the worst start in his entire career, even dating back to when he was a 19 year old Baltimore Oriole rookie phenom. And since April, only one home run, though he did pop one today. One home run hitting 152 Ooh. since April 9th. He's not the same guy at home plate. So those are my perspectives. You know, we can't say small sample size any longer, John. No. No, because the Padres have played 26 games. And these yeah. guys are playing every day, so they're getting a lot of at-bats. Mm-hmm. I don't know what they're going to do about Soto. Yeah, what, what just floors me, there are so many, quote, Smart guys, Padres front office, coaches, dugout, Bob Melvin. Am I the only one that sees the flaws at home plate with his stride movement? You look at video. Just go watch the replay of the Padre game. Mm-hmm. He's tomahawking the ball. He's not getting clean, powerful yeah, swings. So. I agree. So that's where we are. Those are my thoughts on the Padres. Your reaction? Um, yeah, so he's talking about the Padres. You're right. Like Soto, it seems like he, he tops the ball, you know? And so he just grounds out to the right side a lot. You know, even Mud and Don today were talking about how Soto used to hit a lot the opposite field to left field. And he's only done that once this year. So... You know, Melvin shook up the lineup, and he had Cronenworth batting at the top, and Machado now at five. And you know, yeah, Machado hit a home run. You know, he got the ball, and, and you know, the wind was working in the left field, but Tatis almost had a home run to right, but it, he like hit the the wind coming in off Lake Michigan. That is so discouraging, and and it's not just these two months with Soto, um, or this month of the season in April, but it goes back to last year in August and September. He was way below, so. I just wonder what's going on. You know, is it something in the drinking water in San Diego? Why is this such a struggle? Bad mechanics. Bad mechanics. Rocking. Bat movement. Not able to read the pitch coming. And then look at the swings. So I, he is just a mechanical mess, and there's nobody that wants to address it. And I, I just don't understand it. But... 13 and 13, a lot of baseball still to be played, but they've underachieved as far as I'm concerned right now because they've played some bad teams and they haven't mopped up the floor Mm -hmm. with the bad teams they've played. On we go, next team. Okay, on we go. is uh, Let's go up to I-5 to to see how the L.A. Dodgers are doing. I mean, they're not the Dodgers of old. 13 and 13. Welcome to the new world. Mm. At least this new world for one season as the Dodgers kind of reset their roster and their baseball payroll. Uh, you know, the Dodgers have got some guys that are hitting well. We we talked and laughed in spring training about James Outman, career minor leaguer. They saw things, and they built with him. They fixed his mechanics. He's hitting over 300. Nice. He's hitting home runs. He's hitting for extra bases. He's stealing bases. So this has been a very pleasant surprise. This is the replacement uh, for Cody Bellinger. Um, Max Muncy, after a lousy start, Man, has he found his home run swing. He's got 11 bombs already. 11? 11 home runs. Wow. <laughs> and, you know, if he, if he can push his batting average into the 260s, 270s, and continues to hit with power, even though he plays third base like a, he's got a garbage can cover <laughs> on his glove. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he's not real good at third base right now. Uh, you know, that's, that's huge because they, they really need uh, that power there. Uh, Freddie Freeman has had a real quiet start to the month. I'm kind of surprised. I think he's hitting 289. He's not hit home runs of recent time, but it's a long baseball season, and Freddie Freeman is Freddie Freeman. He'll hit. Mookie Betts has had a slow start, which is kind of surprising, batting in and around 249 or so. So the, the Dodgers just are not a complete baseball team, but it's a very different baseball team from what it was before. The loss of Gavin Lux at shortstop has hurt them with a season-ending injury. Miguel Rojas, who they got from Miami, is not even hitting his weight. Uh, Miguel Vargas seems a little overwhelmed at second base. 
Uh, they did just bring up Mike Bush, second baseman, who's hitting 337 Oklahoma City. So maybe they're going to sit one of these other infielders down and let Bush swing and see if he can handle major league pitching. On we go. Let's go to the third team that we're covering here. Okay, yeah. I mean, the Angels are an intriguing team here because Shohei Otani is just having a hell of a, a year at, on the mound. Can you say MVP? I don't know if you want to say Cy Young Award winner, but is it humanly possible that Showtime Otani can do this? Wow. I mean, he's hitting about 265. He's got six home runs. As a starting pitcher coming into today's game, 2-0, and 0-6-4 ERA. Wow. 38 strikeouts and 28 innings. And he takes the ball every fifth day, and he plays... Every other day of the week. Oh, what a phenomenal athlete yeah. human being this is. Mm-hmm. No wear and tear, doesn't get fatigued, and so far so good on the mound. There's been no physical setbacks. It's been years now since he had the forearm and oboe surgery. So, I mean, Otani has just been the cornerstone there. Uh, other guys, Mike Trout, hitting three eleven. Nice. He's got six bombs. Hunter Renfro. Now, maybe it's because he's got support in the batting order. The ex-Padre hitting 280. He's got seven home runs already this season. Right on. Good for him. And exactly. And he's playing a real fearsome left field for them. Uh, have you seen Anthony Rendome at all? Is he on the street somewhere? No. no. <laughs> Last <laughs> I saw him, he was arguing with one of the fans in the stands. Yeah, popping the fan. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's hitting 211. Oh, man. No home runs. This is a guy they paid phenomenal money to to yeah. lure him from the Washington Nationals. Mm-hmm. And he just has hardly done anything two years running because of the major injuries. And now he's healthy. Two eleven zero bombs for a guy making Ooh. mega money. Um, you know, the Angels are hanging tough. They're at 500 right now. Their pitching has to hold up. So your response? Yeah, so as far as the Angels are going, who else is in that starting rotation other than Shohei Otani that's really having a decent start to the season? Tyler Anderson, the Dodger left-hander, has come in has been the number two guy. He's given him, I think, two good outings, one shaky outing. Mm-hmm. Uh, young pitchers, but the young pitchers are just they're real hot and cold. Patrick Sandoval has thrown some good outings and then gotten shelled. Same thing with Jose Suarez. Uh, Reed Detmers has pitched much more competitively. He's a young kid, number one pick out of BYU. I think they've got a collection of arms, but the young kids have good outings and then really bad outings, and <laughs> that kind of plagues them. I don't think they've got a real trustworthy bullpen, which is a big issue over 162 games. So I'd say out of the gate, Angels, because they're bombing the ball, that's been a pleasant surprise, but there's an awful lot of baseball to be played. Yeah, a ton. So, On we go. Let's talk NBA basketball. Yeah, I mean, the playoffs have just been tremendous. I was just watching the Kings-Warriors last night. It was awesome. So, uh, yeah, the Lakers, the Clippers, they seem to be going in different directions. Well, the, the Lakers get the Memphis Grizzlies at home. They're up three games to two in the series. Cannot afford to have Memphis win at Crypto.com Arena. But Memphis is, is one of the weaker road teams in the league. They kill people at home back in the FedEx Center in Memphis. Uh, but the Lakers, this is a wear and tear fatigue series. And if you look closely at Memphis, they just push the ball up the floor every trip. They launch a lot of crazy threes. They hit threes. They they are fearless going to the basket. I've never seen a little guy like John Morant take the kind of pounding Go into the lane against big guys just constantly. And here's the big issue for the Lakers. LeBron and Anthony Davis and AD is playing possessed, but they're piling up a lot of minutes. And you don't get a lot of rest time when you're playing every other night, and especially when you're playing every other night against that type of offense mm-hmm. that the Grizzlies are running at you. Uh, Lakers have to win this this home game and end this series because if they got to go back to Memphis on the weekend— I just, I just think they're going to pass out. They just, I just, and their bench has been so mm-hmm. erratic and so mm-hmm. hot and cold. And Memphis just has the attitude: we're going to the basket, and if we get fouled, we get fouled. And if we make unbelievable plays, that'll trigger us. And Memphis can shoot the three. And Memphis just—they're running all kinds of guys off the bench. They got all kinds of fouls to use. I mean, we've seen them double and defend LeBron. We've seen them double down on the paint and take AD out of the mix. They kind of scare me because they are so doggone explosive. Clippers season is over. This is horrible. Kawhi Leonard, 
torn meniscus. Same knee that he tore the ligaments in. Mm -hmm. Same knee that he tore the quad and he missed an entire season. Um, His career has really been badly impacted over the wear and tear factor. They're going to meet with another doctor to get a second opinion as to how they do this. When you got meniscus tears, if it's a small tear, you can suture it. If it's a big tear, you take all the meniscus out. Mm. But the issue is then it becomes bone on bone. And you know the kind of pounding you put on your legs yeah. playing in the NBA. So it's a big issue. And you got that compounded by the constant injury problem for Paul George. Kawhi and George missed 56 games this season. That's why the Lakers are out of the playoffs. Couldn't have, have them for the, this, this last playoff mm-hmm. series against Phoenix. The bigger picture, they have a monster salary cap problem. They're like $40 million over the cap. Wow. And the new CBA kicks in this summer. And the big question, can they afford to keep all these guys on the roster? And and now you got the injury factor on top of the money factor. Uh, so as great an owner as Steve Ballmer has been, they got some real tough decisions to make going forward on the health and the surgery for Kawhi. What should it be? They, there have been NBA players have had this surgery that have missed six months. One guy in Cleveland missed an entire year. It's a complex surgery. So the big issue for, you know, what happens to Kawhi's career? I think the other shocker in the whole situation is, you know, Kawhi's track record. He has missed. I just went back and looked at this. He and Paul George together, composite record 96 and 46 when they play together. Okay, that's good. Phenomenal accomplishment, but they can't keep him on the floor. Like I said, they missed 56 games this season. Kawhi has missed 139 games in three years with the Clippers. Wow. 139. And in his career, San Antonio to Toronto to L.A., he's missed 310 games in his career in the NBA with three major injuries now. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is a real bad situation. And if this is not bad enough, the story has not gotten a lot of legs Kawhi Leonard's sister in Riverside has been sentenced to life in prison. Mm. She was involved in a murder case. Her and another woman attacked a woman at Pachanka Casino, fractured her skull, and the woman died. So his sister, this week, while he was trying to get healthy, sentenced to life imprisonment. So a lot of things going on in Kawhi Leonard's life. Your thoughts on the Lakers and the Clippers? Well, as far as the Lakers go, this Austin Reeves kid is unbelievable. I mean, the way he can... Pass and he gets LeBron and AD involved. I've been really impressed with him. I mean, but as far as the um, the Clippers go, you feel bad for Kawhi because he's had these injuries. But I saw this bit on um, I can't remember what show it was. But it was JJ Redick. It was kind of getting an argument with Stephen A. Smith, you know, because they were questioning Kawhi's let's say his his will to be on the court. And and J.J. Reddick says, hey, man, you don't understand. You've never played in the NBA. I've never seen a guy so meticulous about the way that he works out and trains and prepares. If he can't go, then he can't go. And it turned out that the, the injury was far bigger than we thought. And if it comes out of Stephen A. Smith's mouth, <laughs> put an asterisk next to it because I'm willing to argue with him every day about everything that he says. But Reddick obviously paints a realistic picture mm-hmm. of the wear and tear factor in pro basketball. But I, I feel bad for Kawhi because th- if, if they take all the cartilage out of the knee, now it's a very different knee. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know how you play 82 games mm. uh, with the pounding and the wear and tear factor. Uh, boom, before we move on to our next topic, remind everybody about our fans forum and how they can subscribe to what we do on our podcasts. Yeah, sure. So um, you could subscribe, you know, wherever you get your podcasts on all the audio only platforms. Be sure to also subscribe on YouTube. You know, our subscriptions are really kind of going through the roof lately on YouTube. So love seeing that. Thanks for all your support. And you can get involved in the fans forum. Just drop your take, your question in the live chat on facebook or youtube we'll get you involved at the conclusion of the show and a reminder check my website it's all written you'll like what i had to say about the nfl draft it's on the website right now leehacksawhamilton.com we invite you also to alert all your friends about what we're doing with a thursday podcast or monday bonus podcast give us a thumbs up and we want you to rate and review 
I'm sorry. I have no pride. If you like this podcast, give us a five star. John has less pride than me. He'll take a four star (laughs) along the way. But rate and review for us uh, on on our podcast. On we go. We've got other topics on the table briefly. Let's blow through some of these. Yeah, I mean, so there's just a ton going on in the NHL as well. This series, Kings and the Oilers, is tremendous. Uh, It's been a spectacular series. The beginning of the NHL playoffs first round. Kings situation. They've let Edmonton back in the series. They've gone back to Los Angeles, and now they're facing a must-win game. They're down three games to two. Uh, I will tell you, this uh, Edmonton-LA series has just been a test of wills. Both teams got goal scores that scare you every time they fly into the zone. Leon Dreisaitl has just been unstoppable for Edmonton. The Oilers superstar Connor McDavid is so big, so fast, so dangerous. Edmonton shortcoming, young, shaky goaltender. Kings goaltenders are getting peppered with a lot of shots. Two guys that I've not seen as much from that I really thought would step up and have to step up to get propel the Kings into the second round. They need more from Anzi Kopitar. They need more from Adrian Kempe. They've not gotten it yet. Must win game there. The duck season is over. They've begun fixing everything that's wrong. And I was a little bit surprised that the story came out as quickly as it did. The Ducks have not hired a head coach yet, but they have hired a coach for the San Diego Gulls coming off a miserable 21 season. His name is Matt McIntyre. He he comes from Germany. He won four straight championships with Red Bull Salzburg in the German Pro League. Four straight titles in a row. Was an assistant coach prior to that with other clubs. Has Has had a lot of success coaching in Europe. Young guy, smart guy. That's good. Got a track record here. Resume looks good to me. Doesn't mean a hill of beans if the general manager of the Anaheim Ducks does not give him better players Mm. than what we saw run through at the sports arena this past winter. But Matt McIntyre, good track record. And now it's up to Pat Verbeek to get young players in here and maybe sign a few veteran guys who can stabilize your roster for the Ducks to be good. So on we go, NHL playoffs. You know, and aside from the from the Kings Oilers series, because I've been glued to that. And I've been doing split screen because I'm also looking at my <laughs> Maple Leafs mm-hmm. against the Tampa Lightning, and that's take no prisoner warfare hockey too. So, first round of the NHL playoffs have really been cool. Yeah. So uh, the I was watching the you know the Edmonton series, and you remember in Game Four, Edmonton was up three nothing, or excuse me, the other way around. The Kings were up three nothing, and then Edmonton came ro- Edmonton came roaring back. I mean, that's been a tremendous series. But the other angle, I think, with the Ducks, and I saw this, I think you had responded to someone on Twitter, that they're clearing house, not just with a lot of their players and coaches, but they're like one of their announcers. Yeah, Uh, which really surprised me. I don't know the story behind the story, but sometimes that's economics and all that. But uh, the the NHL lottery is in mid-May, and they have the best chance of anybody in the league to get the number one pick. And the number one pick is Cam Bedard, young goal-scoring phenom from the Regina Pats of the Western Hockey League. Now, the only way he makes it here is with the Ducks because if he can't make the NHL roster as a first-year player, he doesn't come to San Diego. He goes back uh, to the Canadian Junior League as an, as an underage drafted player. But if they get him to go with Trevor Zegers, to go with Jamie Drysdale. Mm. Uh, they've, they've got themselves, Mason McTavish also, they've got themselves a small core of really young guys that can play in the NHL at this level. But they need a lot more players and need a lot more productivity. They are going to have a fair amount of salary cap space too going forward. So that's that's what May and that's what June will be like as we go towards the NHL draft. So then the next thing is not just are the Kings taking the step to the next round. The next thing will be the NHL draft lottery. And do the Ducks get lucky and do they get Bedard, who they say is a generational mm. player, to put with all the other young guys that they've got? Next topic. Okay, moving on. I, this is the names in the news segment and um, some updates on our, our former Aztec punter, the punk god. Yeah, I'm talking about uh, Matt Ariza. And I, I, we are sitting here now in the middle of the off season as the draft begins, and he has not been signed by anybody, which I think is really sad. Uh, obviously, he got himself involved in a really bad situation. He made a really bad decision. 
He was never charged with a gang rape. None of the players were charged with a gang rape. There was a civil lawsuit that's out there. What I don't understand, though, an NFL franchise, the, the league has a history of giving players second chances. I mean, there are so many guys that have bounced back into the National Football League who've really been involved in bad stuff. Mm -hmm. We had a Rams linebacker, drunk driving conviction, killed a man, sat out a year in prison, came back and played for the St. Louis Rams, Leonard Little. Oh, yeah. We've had guys who've been involved in domestic abuse, in gun incidents. We've had gambling situations where guys have been suspended, removed, allowed back. Mm -hmm. Ariza should not be penalized because he made a stupid decision as a senior at San Diego State. I mean, the police have indicated consensual sex. Now, the lawsuit is going to say she was raped, but he was never charged. I'm surprised at this date that Ariza has not gotten a minimum wage free agent contract offer to go to somebody's camp so he can play football again, in essence, resurrect his career. Um, Maybe post-draft, Somebody will make that move, but I feel bad for the kid. And since when in the NFL have players lost their careers because of stupid decisions? Not very often because a lot of these guys get reinstated. And a lot of these guys have been involved in a lot worse junk than he did uh, at that campus party where he was never, ever charged. Um, that's that's my spin on it. I feel bad for the kid. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to say, uh, you know, legally he wasn't charged. I mean, we can speculate how the whole thing went down. But if the fact that he wasn't charged should give all the NFL teams a green light to sign him. So, you know, he's a local kid here, Rancho Bernardo High School. I, I love to see him back in the league. Um, we'll see what happens. But, you know, it's after the draft. They go seven rounds. Then it goes into free agent mode. So maybe he gets picked up at that time. Yeah, because. OTAs will begun, begin as we roll into May. So hopefully he'll have an opportunity to come kick for somebody, improve himself, and rebuild career, rebuild reputation. On we go. Uh, on we go. And, and this is a couple of other interesting names in the news, but this Mikey Williams story is something. Mikey Williams, high school basketball star, San Ysidro, uh, scored uh, 71 points in a game and then disappeared. He and, quote, family moved to North Carolina, and he was going to play for one of the basketball powers there. Uh, Spent two years there, came home, played this past season. There's a lot of junk going on off the court involving this kid. He is facing four to 40 years in prison for a gunfire incident at his house. Now, I know there's a lot of side stories about the kid, his ability to market himself. He's a great high school player. Maybe go to college, play at Memphis for uh, Penny Hardaway. But there's, a, there's just a lot, of, a lot of junk involved with this kid. And I asked this burning question, who is advising him? I don't care that because of his endorsements and all the creative things he did to market Mikey Williams, I don't care that he's made all this money. I don't care that he's got 5 million TikTok followers. <laughs> Who is advising him on lifestyle and life's important decisions? I, we don't know the full facts. All we know is he got charged after an alleged party at his house and an incident at the house came out of the house with a gun and fired shots into a car as people drove away. Mm. Five felony counts, felony, four to 40 years. You know, I I hate to use the word. I'm I'm not going to try to prejudge him. But when you make the kind of decisions that this kid is making, it sure looks like he's a gangbanger to me. And that really bothers me because what I fear, I don't care who you are, how great you are, football, basketball, talk show host, whatever, (laughs) you're a gangbanger with guns. Mm Mm-hmm. You're going to wind up shot in an alley. So who is advising him? And he comes from a family of athletes. Right. His father was a successful basketball player. So I'm, I'm just really disturbed here. And he can't talk his way out of five felony counts on no. Mikey Williams, San Jacinto, basketball star. I hope this is not a bad ending, but I don't like the beginning of the story. And again, young man makes a really, really bad decision. But I also throw it back. Who's advising this kid, controlling this kid, directing the young man? Because right now, I don't think Memphis is going to offer him a scholarship. I think he's toxic. Yeah, I think so. So they got that. The other story is really strange. Ty Buckner, really good high school quarterback, graduated early, enrolled at Notre Dame early. This was the quarterback of the future. Then Brian Kelly left and went to LSU. Played last year. 
uh, started the end of the first season, got started last season, got hurt, missed the rest of the season. Looks like he kind of lost his job to a transfer from Wake Forest with a new coaching staff. So he hops out of Notre Dame and signs today to go to Alabama. Hmm. He's following Tommy Reese, who was the Irish offensive coordinator, who went to Tuscaloosa to coach under Nick Saban. I guess I'm kind of disappointed. Uh, Notre Dame is really special. South Bend is a really special place to play. And I thought this really special kid, why wouldn't you stay with the coaching staff you know (laughs) and the offense you're adjusted to? Why wouldn't you just stay and compete for the starting job rather than bail because a Wake Forest quarterback came in as a graduate player for only one year? So I was a little bit surprised. Uh, I think he'll do well at Bama because Bama's got great, great players and his his coordinator's there. But, geez, why would you bail out of South Bend? Yeah, I mean, you're right. It is a special place. But if Alabama comes calling, I mean, that's not a bad place to land. Uh, But going back to Mikey Williams, isn't it just sad how – these are recurring stories with athletes. And for him, I mean, in high school, I mean, is he, is he is even 18 yet? He might still be 17 for all I know. But it's just sad that you find these cases of these tremendous athletes that get caught up in the wrong things in their life. And like to your point, who's giving them advice? Who's guiding them? Who are their role models? Um, it's just really sad. And, and it just see this kind of thing happen. Yeah, yeah. And my biggest fear, you don't talk your way out of this. No, you don't plea bargain your way out of a felony. Luckily, nobody was hit by the bullets. Yeah. Thank goodness. When you're standing there, pop, 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 pop into a car. Mm-hmm. There's no guarantee that that's not going to do damage. So I'm, I'm, I'm just really stunned at the depths of the story. Final topic on the table. Okay, we got one more. We're going to talk a little bit about golf. There's a merger going on. You you broke this with me. I'm curious to see what the story is. Greg Norman, who heads up LIV. He's the one that's helped creatively drive what's happened with the Saudi Super League and drawing all those named players with all the big bonus money to go abroad. They made contact with the LPGA about some type of working agreement where they would expand, they do a global tournament with LIV financial backing. Hmm. Um, the PGA has met with the LPGA to talk about taking them under the PGA umbrella and helping market them, conduct their tournaments, bigger prize money, etc. It's fascinating to see where this is going to go. Now, That being said, the LPGA Tour is not what it used to be. You know, I worked in sports talk radio a long time, and at one point in time, we had phenomenal women playing on the LPGA Tour. Pat Bradley, Patty Sheehan, a friend of mine, Betsy King, a whole group of really good young stars. The LPGA Tour took a different turn. All of a sudden, all these great Asian-American players Mm -hmm. came from Japan and Korea, and they have an entourage of superstar talent. It's just absolutely phenomenal. But what we found is as they took over the LPGA Tour, two things happened. None of those great young players really spoke English. So how do you market somebody who's not a stateside personality does not know nor does not want to understand the language. How do you market your tour with a superstar from South Korea? Mm -hmm. It's become a real big issue. And and for some reason, America is not, outside of Michelle Wee, and then she had injury problems, Mm -hmm. America's not been able to find the next great female superstar for the LPGA tour. So they've kind of languished out there. We used to have an LPGA stop here. In Poway, mm. at the golf course. And that mm-hmm. golf course at Stone Ridge is now gone. Yeah, it's gone. Um, it's it's really sad because at one point of time, the LPGA was spectacular. And they played for big money, the Dinah Shore up in Palm Springs. And it's it's become an international event, but it's not an event that Americans identify with right now. So under the PGA umbrella, yeah, maybe they can, they can help them. Uh, but... Greg Norman's walking around with a checkbook, and they keep writing checks with Saudi money backing it. And with the LPGA, take the Saudi money and say, we're going to try to make a global tour with Greg Norman's guidance. But does does that help us here in the States? That interesting story. Don't know where the outcome is going to be. I I just think it's great how 
all of sports is so global now. I mean, like the Padres, we have a South Korean on the Padres sure. and, and a Japanese player on the Padres, and they speak limited English, but they're still superstars. They're still beloved by the fans. So, you know, we're seeing this with, with women's golf, but it seems like a lot of other women's sports, like the WNBA, um, even like uh, the, the U.S. Uh, women's national team for soccer, they've combined forces, the men and the women. And so maybe that is the pathway where they can combine resources and they can you know, leverage each other to the degree that they're going to get the women a lot more exposure and more money. Well, they'll get exposure. They'll definitely get more money, regardless of which merger takes place. But America, for some reason, they have to develop another star. And it's probably been a good five years since we really had something of legitimacy mm-hmm. at the top of, of the LPGA leaderboard. Great players abroad. My goodness. And I don't think anybody had any knowledge of what was going on in Japan and what was going on in South Korea and in Taiwan with all these players dominating whatever their tour was. Mm-hmm. Now they've come here and they've just done phenomenal things. But how do you market them? It's a it's a huge, huge debate hyphen Argument. Okay, are we ready for fans forum? I think we are. I mean, we got a, just a ton in here, so let's see if we can get through some of these questions. And um, and and this is uh, this is about the Charger draft. This is from Daniel Carlin. He says Bijan, Kincaid, or Meyer. It's going to be one of those three. Uh, but the the rumblings are that Bijan stock is going up. He might be the only running back that is taken in the first round of this draft. Uh, he may not be there at 21. But again, if strange things happen in front of the Chargers, that means some other guys are going to fall back to them at 21. I'd be in favor of taking either one of the tight ends. I've seen Kincaid a lot. And that's a guy who really does things going down the seam. Can you say George Kittle and mm. maybe even more athletic than George Kittle? Uh, so I, I think it's it's probably going to be one of the tight ends. If something strange happens and both tight ends are gone and the running back is gone, then they should draft the pit defensive tackle, um, who I, I think they desperately need to. On we go. On we go. Here's a good one here from Angel Barragon. And he says, Hacksaw versus Stephen A in a debate. I'll watch it. My money's on Hacksaw. I can yell as loud <laughs> as he can. Um, I don't know Stephen A. that well. Uh, he's a former journalist. I really enjoyed him when he wrote and covered sports in Philadelphia. Um, he's really, his career has just really taken off. The only issue is that he just now tends to sit there and yell and, <laughs> and give me, you know, give me some depth of knowledge rather than yelling at me on my TV. You're entitled to your opinion, but all he does is yell. And a lot of the stuff that he that he throws out there now is it's got racial tinge to it. And I just don't think we live with that in every story that has to be discussed. So he's doing well, whether this longevity stays, he seems to be the hot guy. He's everywhere except in my living room. Uh, He's on every every platform Mm -hmm. ESPN has. So. I'd be glad to argue with him any time about topics on the table. Well, that would be fun to have him as a guest <laughs> on the podcast. But uh, I'll tell you what, when Saturday Night Live did a skit, you know, impersonating <laughs> him, you know, I talk about LeBron James, you know, and he was going on about it. It was fantastic. But he, to me, he's he's fun to listen to. Um, I remember with my kids, just have him in the car and we'd listen to Stephen A. And it just made us laugh because because he was entertaining. But he's got a shtick and he knows how to use it. On we go. Next question. Okay, so let's uh, move on down the list here. And um, this is uh, from um, Force Ghost Fabio. He says, Soto, he's going to get the batting coach fired. I mean, do the Padres even have a batting coach? I don't even know. Well, they they change him yearly. It's an annual rite of failure. Mm -hmm. Um, Somebody, I want you to watch the Padre game against the Giants on the weekend. Agree or disagree with me after you watch, then you you get back to us on fans forum. To me, he moves around in the batter's box too much. He is never set. He can't read the pitch because he's changing the levels of his eyes, looking at the pitch coming out of the the ball coming out of the pitcher's hands. And to me, because he's moving so much, he does not get clean swings. It's like he's tomahawking everything. Maybe I should be the padding coach rather than the talk show host, because if I can sight and see this, and I know baseball, if I can see this mechanical flaw, why can't any of the smart people in the dugout or the coaches or the people upstairs, the analytics dudes, why can't they figure this out? 
But you you watch the games. You tell me if I'm right or wrong when we do our bonus podcast come Monday. Okay, I look forward to that. But yeah, you're right. What what are they doing with this guy? Are they maybe kind of hands off because he's a superstar, a prima donna? They don't want to, you know, try to tell him what to do. I mean, come on. Okay, let's move on. We got some questions here that are coming in from the uh, the YouTube channel. Some good comments. So let's get these guys involved too. And we'll go here and here and on down the list. And this is from Blunderbus999. Talk about Aztecs slashing the ticket prices. And he says, you are spot on with this take. The overpriced tickets um, and midday scheduling was stupid. Oh, I agree. Uh, 999, I didn't agree with uh, the, the price hike and everything across the board. I, I just got the sense they were gouging the fans. $40 to park on a gravel lot? You're kidding me. Wow, that's For a that lot. that program? Mm-hmm. Now they might charge $40 in Tuscaloosa. Not at, They should not charge that at San Diego State. Price, price t- tickets were way too high. And they got a great burst, and people were excited about Snapdragon, and they sold a record number of season tickets. The, the starting time of the Arizona game was dictated by TV. That's not on San Diego State's situation. But the fans went away, and they never came back. Uh, you know, the fact that they struggled to get 17,000 in there for the last group of home games, is a, that's a really bad sign that fans are turned off by what happened. Uh, and I will tell you this, their schedule this year, what a bonanza. I mean, they're going to get UCLA in here, and they're going to get their bad rivals in here, Fresno and Boise and Nevada. I mean, what a great home schedule. But are the fans going to come out? Because they're sure peeved about the ticket prices, and they're sure peeved at Brady Hoke's offense. But let's give them a little bit of space. Let's see what they look like in the first game against my alma mater, Ohio U. And let's see if they can throw the ball down the Mm -hmm. field, and let's see if they can protect Jalen Maiden. And let's see what else they do in the transfer portal because they got some scholarships to use, and I think there's going to be probably three more additions here uh, in the next couple weeks. But I, I... They mishandled the entire launch of Snapdragon, and now they've turned the town off, and Brady's got to find the key to plug it back in to turn the light switch on to get fans to come back because they've kind of lost the community a little bit, sadly. I mean, they have an opportunity to make this a fan experience like Petco Park, you know, especially on Saturday nights, you know, under the lights and the warm fall uh, evenings. I mean, it could be special. Hopefully they get their ducks in a row this year. But you got to win. Yeah. Got to win. That's mm-hmm. all there is to it. We march on. We march on. This is about the NFL draft. This is from uh, Sports Comics 559. Jake Hayner, top five QB in the 2023 NFL draft. Well, 599, uh, Hayner's going to go in the draft. I don't, it's not going to be first round. I don't, I'm not even sure it's going to be second round. But I'll tell you, the Brock Purdy arrival last year in San Francisco has changed everything as the way that teams are looking for quarterbacks. Uh, We had the report this past Monday on our bonus podcast that as many as 16 quarterbacks could get drafted. Now, the bulk of them will be at the back of the first round. But everybody is now looking for a gem that maybe we can develop. And one NFL scout said this past week, Jake Hayner has all the qualities and intangibles of Drew Brees. Mm -hmm. Gritty, stands in the pocket, very accurate, real smart dude. You know, when Drew Brees came out of Purdue, he was 5'10", and he was an afterthought, and Miami said, no, we're not drafting him, and the Chargers wound up taking him later, and he evolved, and then he got hurt, and then he went to New Orleans, where he happened to fall in with a mad scientist and a coach in Sean Payton, and 50,000 yards later in a Hall of Fame career, we now know who Drew Brees was. Now, every 5'10 guy comes down the turnpike is not like Drew Brees, but the fact that an NFL scout who has watched Hayner at Fresno State for three years links a lot of the traits that Drew Brees has with the Fresno State quarterback means he's going to get a chance to be on somebody's roster and then learn. And so you you teach him the first year and he goes through the weight and nutrition program and the whole intellect of learning football at the NFL level. Maybe he gets a chance to play. Maybe there's a star in the making because you can't rule out the history of Tom Brady's sixth round, Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant. 
Yeah, I mean, so it would be fun to see where all these quarterbacks go. I mean, did you see Anthony Richardson? He said, I'm from another planet. I'm from another world. So all these guys have interesting stories. There's also been some comments on our YouTube channel, people that are really questioning C.J. Stroud and whether he is really up to playing at the NFL level, you know, both you know mental and physical. So uh, I, this, this draft's going to be great. What time does it start tonight? Five o'clock. Five okay. o'clock on Thursday. Don't call me. Don't text me. I'll be watching in the NFL draft for a while. Okay. We've got a couple more here you want to run through? We do here. And here's one from Oakland, about the Oakland A's. This is from Arthur Korf. And he says, yeah, the 2002 total Major League pay, uh, payroll was about $2 billion. Now it's over $4 billion, so it's doubled. But the A's payroll has gone down from 2002 to 2022. Well, payrolls are all spun off the gross revenue, the amount of money that Major League Baseball's taken in on all their contracts, sponsorships, TV deals, etc. I mean, baseball at one point was a $3 billion industry down the bottom of the ladder. Baseball is now an $11 billion industry. John, it has rocketed in about five years. Wow. Now, it's not equal to the National Football League, but it's doggone right there. Mm -hmm. So that's why the payrolls have just gone up. As, as the total gross revenue comes in the front door, a chunk of that package goes into the player's pool. Therefore, their salaries are going to go up. That's why average salary this year is 44 that includes a superstar. That includes a 25th man on the roster. So there's a lot more money there. The whole Oakland situation, to me, is an absolute disgrace. Uh, the fact that, that John Fisher was allowed to take all this revenue sharing and TV money, put it in his pocket, and not develop players. Mm. I mean, that's why they're sitting there at 5-20 and 20 right now. Uh, then, obviously, they, they tried really hard with the city of Oakland, which I think is destitute, near bankrupt, to come up with a stadium. But Fisher wanted... Oakland and Alameda County to pour a lot of money in as their share. Now, he was going to pay f for a large chunk of the stadium himself, but there's infrastructure and there's land development. There's a lot of things that go into building a business entity. It's just not a stadium. It's a business development around everything there at the Seaport District, and Oakland does not have the money. And then Fisher just walked away and went to Vegas. But it's a real big baseball problem. And if you have John Fisher owning this team going to Vegas and they're going to build a new stadium, what's to say Fisher's not going to do the same doggone thing and pocket more money in Las Vegas mm -hmm. in a new entity? So I just have a real problem with with not just Rob Manfred, because this also goes to the union, not interceding and mandating that these guys have to spend more money. That's where we are in baseball. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's also getting increasingly more difficult to build stadiums in California. And 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 granted, you know, th th we have Petco and the Warriors built an arena, but it's still it's tough. And now you got three major league or pro level teams that have exited Oakland, you know, with the Warriors, the Raiders, and now the A's. So maybe it's just tough to do business in Oakland. Well, it is because Oakland's got a lot of serious problems. It's mm -hmm. got a population problem. It's got an economic problem. It's got a gun violence problem. Mm -hmm. Oakland's reputation, certain parts of Oakland, is really, really bad. But, you know, your city is what your city is. And if there's no industry in Oakland, then how are you going to raise tax money to be able to rebuild, put it into your infrastructure? It's a huge problem. But baseball should have never allowed Fisher to operate the franchise, quote, the money ball theory, yeah. the way this franchise was operating, when they gave him all this revenue sharing, and he was getting a cut of the piece of the TV pie. Mm -hmm. Hey, listen, hope you've enjoyed our Thursday podcast. We invite you to be with us every Thursday. We do a bonus package on Monday. Monday, we'll do a recap of the NFL draft, and Monday, we'll wait for you to participate to tell us how to solve the Juan Soto problem and whether you agree or disagree <laughs> with what the Chargers had to say. And again, tell your friends about our podcast. Share the information. We invite you to subscribe. Check my website. It's all written, leehacksawhamilton.com. Give us a thumbs up, and I'll take a five-star rating if you're willing to offer a five-star rating, even though John <laughs> would accept the four-star rating out there in left field. John, enjoy the draft. Have yourself a great sports weekend. We will sit here, talk, and argue sports on Monday. Yeah, right on. Looking forward to it, Lee. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the draft. Have yourself a great sports weekend. Thanks for being with us on Hacksaw's Headlines. Join us again for Hacksaw's Headlines on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And find the audio version on your favorite podcast app. Touchdown, San Diego! For more content, go to LeeHacksawHamilton.com.